Welcome to the Global Classroom of Logos Bible Study with Dr. Bill Creasy. Our lesson is about to begin, so get comfortable and open your Bibles. So welcome to the beginning of our study of the book of Deuteronomy, the last book in the Torah. We're going into lesson number one right now, which I've titled, These Are the Words, and we'll be covering chapter one, verses one through four. By way of preview, Deuteronomy is the fifth book of the Pentateuch. The Pentateuch is a Greek word, penta, five, tukos, books. Five books, the five books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. So Deuteronomy is the fifth book of the Pentateuch, the final book of the Torah, and the last of the five books of Moses. It begins, these are the words that Moses spoke. And it concludes with the death of Moses and an account of his mysterious burial in a valley in the land of Moab opposite Beth Peor. And to this day, no one knows where Moses is buried. In between, we have three great speeches or discourses spoken by Moses, the very man who in Exodus claimed to be slow of speech and tongue. Now, Deuteronomy concludes by observing that since Moses' death, no prophet has arisen in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. Moses is the prophet of the Hebrew Scriptures. Indeed, in the Gospels, Jesus quotes from Deuteronomy more times than from any other book except the Psalms. So Deuteronomy is a very important book not only in Judaism, but also in our study of the New Testament. I have for you a painting by Philippe de Champagne, Moses with Ten Commandments and Oil on Canvas from 1648 in the Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg, Russia. I had never seen this painting before, and I was looking for a different painting of Moses to show you, and I had always pictured Moses as looking like Charlton Heston. But... Uh, <laughs> I think that's a very intriguing Moses. So there he is. Now to continue the preview, as the closing book of the Torah, Deuteronomy is much more than a simple retelling of the law, as its Greek title, Deuteronomy, might suggest. The Greek title is Deuteronomion, second law, second law. But rather, it's a daring oration that recapitulates the 40 years in the wilderness, an exhortation to observe the law if the Israelites wish to possess the land that God has given them, and a reminder that if they disobey the law and they lose the land, which we know they most certainly will, then the only repentance will bring them back to it. Now, curiously, Although Deuteronomy completes the Torah, fitting perfectly into the canonical structure of the Hebrew Scriptures, we began with Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and now Deuteronomy, a straight linear narrative. And Deuteronomy fits as the capstone of that five-book narrative. It fits perfectly. But yet, its perspective seems to be that of looking back upon history not looking forward. It seems to know the catastrophic events that unfolded between Israel's conquest of the land in Joshua, beginning around 1406 BC, and of their losing the land to the Assyrians in 722 and the Babylonians in 586. In Deuteronomy, we're standing on the plains of Moab, east of the Jordan River, and Moses is about to speak to the people. But it seems like it's looking the other direction, from the other end of history. Moses seems to know all these events that have taken place. So in this lesson, we'll place Deuteronomy within its proper canonical context, while in lesson two, we'll explore how Deuteronomy came to be written and how its unique perspective on history operates. So Deuteronomy, 
receives its English title from the Greek translation of Deuteronomy 17, verse 18, repetition of the law, Deuteronomion, or Deuteronomy, a repetition of the law or second law. But like the book of Numbers, the Hebrew title better reflects Deuteronomy's content and character. The Hebrew title of Numbers was Bemidbar, in the wilderness, recall. And that was a better title for the book of Numbers. We called it Numbers because we counted people at the beginning and at the end. But Bemidbar, in the wilderness, that's where they were during the book of Numbers. Here in Deuteronomy, it's Debarim, words, or these are the words, words, Debarim. Drawing on the first words of Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 1, the title Dubarim offers more than a simple description of the book's contents. It offers a striking insight into the character of Moses and into the nature of God's covenant relationship with the Israelites. So it's a very evocative title in Hebrew. Now we first meet Moses in Exodus chapter 2 as an infant, an infant subject to Pharaoh's order that all newborn Hebrew males be killed. Why would Pharaoh issue that order? Now recall our study of Exodus. The Israelites had gone down to Egypt with Jacob, Jacob and his sons and their families, go to Egypt, 70 some people in all, and over 400 years become a people of two million. And where are they located? in the land of Goshen, which, if you envision the Nile Delta, is in the northeastern portion of the Nile Delta. Now the Via Maris, the main international trade route, comes out of Egypt and parallels the Mediterranean all the way up north to Damascus. If you're an enemy and you're going to invade Egypt, you're going to come from the north, not the south, not Africa, you're going to come from the north the Assyrian Empire, Babylonian Empire, and so on later on. If you're an enemy invading Egypt and you have two million slaves between you and the Egyptians, who do you think the slaves are going to join? The invaders. So the Israelites become a major security threat to Egypt itself. Even though they're providing labor, there's a great potential for catastrophe. So Pharaoh orders that all the newborn male Israelites be killed because little boys grow up to be young men who fight and will join the enemy. So we have to thin out the population that way. Well, Moses' mother gives birth to him and she hides him for three months. She doesn't want to kill her son. But after three months, she can't hide him anymore. He's developed quite a set of lungs. And people can hear the newborn child. So Moses' mother has a plan. She's been down at the Nile River every day, watching it. The Nile, a big river, 4,000 miles long, flowing south to north, with, in the Nile Delta, lots of tributaries for irrigation and natural tributaries. At one of those tributaries, Pharaoh's daughter would bathe each morning. Not publicly, of course. It was a private area, very nicely constructed, where she and her entourage would come in the morning for the morning bath. The Egyptians were very clean people. And Moses' mother knew it. And she would watch the Nile, and she would drop a leaf in the Nile, or a twig in the Nile, and watch the current and see how to get to where Pharaoh's daughter was. And once she knew that, she took a basket, coated it with tar and pitch, put a blanket inside, put the baby in the basket, covered him with another blanket, and then sent her daughter, Miriam, down to where Pharaoh's daughter would be to hide in the bulrushes and watch and make sure that the plan worked. And Moses' mother put the basket in the Nile, exactly where she knew to do, to bring that basket to Pharaoh's daughter. And sure enough, that's what happened. 
Moses' mother can hide him no longer, so she took a papyrus basket, dabbed it with bitumen and pitch, and putting the child in it, placed it among the reeds on the bank of the Nile. And his sister Miriam stationed down at the distance, and off goes the basket. As Moses' mother had planned, the basket drifts down the river to the very place where Pharaoh's daughter regularly bathed, and the princes saw it. Well, imagine a basket floating on the shore of the Nile, right next to the shore, with a blue blanket over top. You couldn't miss it. And she had someone go get it. She took the blanket away, and there was a baby. And he was crying. And she felt sorry for him. It's where God brought together a baby's cry and a woman's heart. And she said, it's one of the Hebrew children. At this, Moses' sister Miriam stepped out from her hiding place and she offered to get a Hebrew woman to nurse the baby. Moses' mother is hired to nurse her own baby. What a plan. And little Moses joins the royal family as the adopted son of Pharaoh's daughter. The plan worked. We have a nice illustration, a painting, Nicholas Poussin, The Finding of Moses, Oil on Canvas, 1651, in the National Gallery in London. And we can look at the painting, and you see the, the rocks that are sticking up a little to the right, and you can see Miriam hiding behind them, watching as they fish Moses out of the Nile, and the women are all about, the attendants, and they're looking at him, and they're talking about him. And if we read these verses closely and carefully, we see a very subtle nuance not captured in most translations. Verse 6 reads, literally, she opened it, the basket, and saw the baby crying. Now that's an unusual expression. You would think she heard the baby crying. But the baby wasn't audible. Tears were streaming down his cheeks, his lower lip was quivering, and he wasn't making a sound. She saw the baby crying. Well, the nuance takes on greater importance when we reach Exodus chapter 3. Moses is now an 80-year-old man. Moses grew up in the household of Pharaoh. He would never be a Pharaoh himself. He wasn't of the bloodline, but... He was brought up for an important position at court to be an ambassador, a diplomat, a military leader. And he would have been trained in all the skills needed to do that. He would have had the best education available in his day. But at 40 years old, Moses was out and about and he saw an Egyptian slave master beating a Hebrew. And Moses just could not help himself. He killed the Egyptian slave master. He just blew up and killed him. And a half a dozen people caught it on their iPhone video and it went viral. <laughs> Moses had been found out. So Pharaoh had no choice. Egypt is a nation of law. He issued an arrest warrant for Moses and Moses had to get out of Dodge fast and he did. He went as far away as he could possibly go. He went over to the Gulf of Suez, crossed the Sinai Peninsula, crossed the Gulf of Aqaba, all the way into the land of Midian, Saudi Arabia of today. And he stayed there for 40 years, on the run. At 80 years old, Psalm 90 is ascribed to Moses. And in Psalm 90, we read, the span of a man's life is 70 years or 80 for those who are strong. Moses is 80 years old. He's at the end of his life. But while in the Sinai, tending somebody else's sheep, the lowest of the low jobs, Moses encounters God in a bush and God commands him to leave Midian and go back to Egypt and liberate his people. 
Now, you would think Moses would jump at the chance, but he doesn't. Instead, Moses presents five reasons why he can't go. Number one, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? I'm an old man. I'm at the end of my life. If you had come to me, oh, I don't know, 40 years ago, I might have been able to help you. I've got nothing. I'm not the guy for this. God responded. So Moses said, all right, I'm not saying I'll go, but hypothetically, if I go to the Israelites, and I say to them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask, what is his name? What do I tell them? Because Moses didn't have a clue who this God was. Moses knew all the gods of the Egyptian pantheon. The Israelites, who had lived in Egypt now for 400 years, they didn't know anything about God. They knew the Egyptian gods, 80 plus gods in the Egyptian pantheon. If you've ever been to Egypt and traveled to Luxor and seen the temple of Karnak, a fabulous temple with an army of priests and devotees and sacrifices. Everybody knew those gods. If the Israelites in Egypt knew anything about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, it was but a faint echo of a folktale from a long time ago. Moses didn't know who he was. God counters. So Moses gave reason number three. Well, suppose I go and they don't believe me. What if I go and I'd say, let my people go? And they say, you didn't meet God. You're a loony old man. What do I tell them then? God answered. Moses had reason number four why he couldn't go. Look, Lord, I have never been eloquent. I'm slow of speech and tongue. God responded to that. And finally, Moses said, please, Lord, send someone else. These are pretty lame excuses. Moses doesn't want to go because he's afraid. He's petrified. As a young man, he was a promising prince of Egypt. He was a rising star. But now, he's just an 80-year-old shepherd living on the backside of the desert, a total failure. His life has come to nothing, a life of such promise. He's afraid. Our dog would be afraid to go too. There's scorpions out there. And one's about to get him there on the slide. But Moses' fourth excuse bears directly upon our discussion. I am slow of speech and tongue. Literally, I am without words. A man without words. And this is a remarkable statement by a man who Stephen, in his defense before the Sanhedrin in Acts 7, says was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was powerful in words and deeds. Brought up as a prince of Egypt and educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, Moses was most certainly a skilled orator. Education in ancient times was primarily rhetorical education, learning to make an argument either orally to work in the law and present cases or be a senator and present arguments or written argumentation. Moses would have been skilled in both. Yet, after 40 years in the wilderness of Midian, as a wanted felon, a fugitive, and a shepherd, the lowest job you can possibly have, tending someone else's sheep, his confidence has eroded to nothing. He's a man without words, literally a man with nothing to say. It's all the more remarkable then that God chooses such a man to liberate his people. 
It may be that Moses was a prince of Egypt, educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, a man powerful in words and deeds, but Moses' experience in the wilderness has stripped him bare and reduced him to nothing. In Moses' eyes, he is at the end of a wasted life. In God's eyes, he's at the beginning, and his real education is about to begin. We have a photo, Moses and the Burning Bush. It's a mosaic from the 6th century at St. Catherine's Monastery at Mount Sinai in Egypt. We took this photo a few years back. Notice up in the top right-hand corner, the hand of God is pointing down at Moses and telling him to take off your sandals. You're on holy ground. And Moses is taking off a sandal. And the bush is burning. Moses will follow a very difficult curriculum in his wilderness education. On his way back to Egypt, God sought to put him to death. We read in Exodus 4, verse 24, while his wife Zipporah clearly holds him in contempt, calling him a bridegroom or spouse of blood. What's the context there? On the way back to Egypt with his wife Zipporah, who is the daughter of Jethro, the high priest of Midian, and their two boys, apparently God had told Moses to circumcise his two sons. Hadn't been done. In Egypt, circumcision was a common practice, but apparently not in Midian. So Moses set about to do that. His wife Zipporah, their mother, what are you doing? I'm going to circumcise the boys. You most certainly are not. That's a barbaric practice. You're not doing that to my boys. And they had a big argument. Zipporah took hold of the knife. She circumcised the two boys and flung the foreskins into the face of Moses and said, you bridegroom of blood, you barbarian. Oh, it's only the beginning of a tumultuous marriage for sure. Well, when he arrives in Egypt, Pharaoh tells him flatly, who is this the Lord that I should obey him and let Israel go? Moses got to Memphis, the political capital of Egypt, and he managed to get an appointment with Pharaoh, the most powerful man in the world. And he said, I've been sent here by the Lord to tell you to let my people go. Pharaoh's looking at this loony old man, and he said, who is this, the Lord, that I should obey him and let Israel go? I don't know the Lord, and I most certainly won't let Israel go. Beat it, old man. The Israelites that he's to liberate say, the Lord, look upon you and judge you. You have made us offensive to Pharaoh and his servants, putting a sword in their hands to kill us. Because Pharaoh now doubled their workload. They're being lazy. The union organizer came to town and they want liberation. Right. Not going to happen. Now you've made our life worse, they say. It's not a very good start. But Moses reluctantly perseveres. And as God brings each of the ten plagues on Egypt... Moses begins to find his voice. In their final confrontation, Pharaoh, livid, shouts at Moses, leave me, see to it that you do not see my face again, for the day you see my face you will die. And Moses fires right back, you are right, I will never see your face again. After the tenth plague and the death of all the Egyptian firstborn, Moses leads a people of two million strong out of Egypt and across the Red Sea to the foot of Mount Sinai. Notice it was Pharaoh who ordered the killing of the Israelite males. Now it's God who kills the firstborn Egyptians. They get to Mount Sinai. And there Mount Sinai was completely enveloped in smoke because the Lord had come down upon it in fire. The smoke rose from it as though from a kiln and the whole mountain trembled violently. This is a magnificent scene. As Moses speaks to God, 
he climbs the mountain, he disappears into the smoke and fire, and he speaks to God face to face. The Charles Sprague Pierce Oil on Canvas, Lamentations over the Death of the Firstborn of Egypt, 1877, in the Smithsonian, illustrates what Egypt was like after that 10th plague. Notice we have an Egyptian mother weeping, an Egyptian father weeping, and a casket with their son in it. Every family in Egypt had the death of the firstborn on the same night. It was a catastrophe. The Israelites leave Egypt, off they go. They left the land of Goshen. Ramses here, they started, they moved down to Sukkoth, and rather than take the Via Maris up the coast, the main trade route, they took a desert route down across the Red Sea, probably here at the Bitter Lakes, paralleled the Sinai to Mara, Elim, Rephidim, and finally to Mount Sinai, the route they took. And you can see in the satellite map, if you're coming south on the Via Mars, you're an enemy and you're going to invade Egypt, you've got the land of Goshen and two million Israelites right there. We traveled this route not long ago and we stopped at Mara. In the story in Exodus, the Israelites needed water and they find the oasis at Mara, but the water is bitter, it's no good. We traveled to Mara and there are many wells at the oasis. Today, the water's fine. Back then, not so good. The water is good now though. On the Giza Plateau, between the paws of the Sphinx, a number of documents were found buried. And one of them was a hymn to the Nile. And in that hymn to the Nile, it reads, when the Nile inundates and, and brings the fresh water, every backbone takes on laughter and every tooth is exposed. Everyone's smiling. Well, they are today at Mara. They continued from Mara down to Elim. Elim is another oasis where there were 12 springs of water and 70 palm trees. And it's still a very lush oasis to this day. We travel there, we have it here in our photo. And then leaving between Elim and Sinai, God provides the manna. They needed food. God provides the manna in this location in the photo. And the Israelites would gather it up. This is originally a predella panel. It's now on canvas from 1490 in the National Gallery in London. The Israelites gathering the manna uh, there. They continued on to Rephidim. And at Rephidim, they needed water yet again. And Rephidim, oh, there's, there's a lot of flinty stone but not much water. Here are the stones. This is at Rephidim. And you can see how rugged the rocks and the mountain areas are in this hard flinty stone. But look closely and you will see growing out of the stone a big bush. If you have a bush, you must have water somewhere. We have another oil on canvas, 1666, in a private collection showing Moses. God told him, speak to the rock and water will issue forth. By this time, Moses had had it with the people. He was angry yet again, and he hits the rock twice with his staff and the water comes out. And for that reason, for disobeying God, hitting the rock, not speaking to it, Moses is forbidden to go into the promised land. We'll see him in Deuteronomy at the very end, die east of the Jordan. But we went looking for water at Rephidim, and here we are. That bush was tempting, and my little Bedouin friend here guided me right up the rocks, right to that bush, and I put my hand in, 
way inside, and sure enough, there was damp soil. There's water in the rocks. Now, there could have been other things in there too. I didn't think about it at the time. But now that I'm thinking about scorpions. <laughs> From Rephidim, they moved on to Mount Sinai. And I think one of the best photos that we've taken in Egypt is this photo of Mount Sinai looming in the distance. The summit is 7,497 feet. It's not the highest mountain in the Sinai, it's the second highest by, I don't know, a dozen feet or so, but it looks, from perspective, it looks like the highest, and it's high enough, 7,497 feet. So we're approaching at dusk. Well, if there's a mountain, we're going to climb it. Why? Because it's there. So at midnight, I gathered our whole group together, and we set out to climb Mount Sinai. We left at midnight because we wanted to get to the top to see the sunrise. It was a dark, moonless night, and we made our way up the mountain. I'm leading the people up the mountain. And sure enough, we got there in time for sunrise. But halfway up, unlike Moses, we stopped and had coffee and cookies at a Bedouin hut. <laughs> and then we got to the top and we saw the sunrise from the top of Mount Sinai. Moses would have seen the same thing. It was quite the time. There were, I don't know, half a dozen groups up on top. And when the sun came up, people began singing and praying and speaking in tongues, and it was an amazing experience. Well, as the sun rose and morning came, we have all the mountaintops beneath us here in the Sinai. When you think of climbing a mountain, you think, well, when I hit the summit, job's done. No, the job's half done. Now you have to go back down again. So it takes about three hours to get back down, and down we went, like Moses up the mountain, down the mountain. But Moses was 80 years old. Now once the people received the law and the tabernacle at Mount Sinai in Exodus, and they learned what to do with them in Leviticus, the Israelites then move out in numbers. They move north of Sinai, parallel to the Gulf of Aqaba, they're going all the way up to the northern tip of the Gulf of Aqaba, where the King's Highway, the second international trade route, will come out of Egypt. They'll get on that trade route and go right up to what today is Amman, Jordan, and then drop down to opposite Jericho. That's the plan. So they head north, and they're moving through very, very rugged terrain. They follow on our satellite map my red arrow, moving parallel to the Gulf of Aqaba up into the wilderness of Paran. Now, why do they go there? They're supposed to go to the tip of the Gulf of Aqaba. The King's Highway comes out of the Nile Delta. It cuts across the top of the Sinai Peninsula to the Eastern Mountain Range and then heads north. That was the plan. But look, the Edomites control that side and they refuse to allow permission to use their road. Can't come up on, on our road. Two million people aren't passing through the territory. And they have the military might to back it up. So Moses is forced to move northwest up to Kadesh Barnea, a big oasis, through the wilderness of Paran. And here again, Moses' education continues from one crisis to another. The people complain about the food. God provided manna every morning for them, and it provided all the nutrition they needed. They had manna for breakfast, manna for lunch, manna for dinner on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, weeks one, two, three, four, month one, two, three, four, manna, 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 nothing but manna. They hated it. The same thing every day. 
I imagine Zipporah writing a cookbook, 101 Ways to Cook Manna, and the people complained. They wanted meat. God said, you want meat? I'll give you meat. Not enough for one day or two or three, but until it comes out of your nostrils. So he sends quail. And the people gorge themselves on the quail, and they all get sick. Here's a Rudolph von Ems from the Chronicle of the World, the History of the World. It's at the University of Fulda in Germany from around 1400. And you can see the, uh, the Israelites and all the quail, all the birds around them, and they get sick and a lot of them die from overeating on the quail. Moses' sister Miriam, who fished him out of the Nile, and his brother Aaron, his older brother Aaron, oppose Moses. What, God only spoke to you? What are we, chopped liver? Your older brother, your older sister? And here we have a nice illustration, a fresco from the 10th century at Mount Athos in Greece. We have Moses in the middle, we have Aaron, and we have Miriam who was about to get leprosy over there on the right. The spies. Moses is moving all these people into a land where he's to conquer that land. You need good intel. So he sends spies, 12 of them, one from each tribe, into the land of Canaan. They come back and they say, oh, it is a very good land. In fact, they bring back samples of the produce, a cluster of grapes that were as big as softballs. It's a wonderful land, but the people are huge. They're like giants. We look like insects to them, like grasshoppers. And their cities are huge with big fortified walls. There's no way we can take that land. Can't happen. It's impossible. Here we have an oil on canvas, 1621. It's in the J. Paul Getty Museum up in Los Angeles. Moses and the messengers from Cana. And you can see Moses. And here we have two men holding two clusters of grapes. One is a Chardonnay grape and the other is a Cabernet. They're white and red. And they're saying, we can't do it. It's impossible. The people rebel. The people themselves. Here we have the Botticelli, the punishment of Korah and the stoning of Moses and Aaron. It's a fresco in the Sistine Chapel. Korah leads a rebellion against Moses. They try to stone Moses and Aaron. And the final straw is a young man who's told you're not to work on the Sabbath. All right, fair enough. But that evening he goes out to pick up sticks to make a fire for morning. He just gets the fuel. He, he picks up a few sticks. It's reported back to Moses that he's working on the Sabbath. Moses goes to God. God said, stone him to death. And they do. They stone the Sabbath breaker. This is a James Tussaud. And we have the Sabbath breaker on the ground trying to protect his head. A man holding him down. They're not throwing golf ball rocks at him. Look at the size of that rock that the guy had. He's going to crush his skull with it like a ripe watermelon. They stone the man for picking up sticks. That's the last straw. The people have had it. We are out here with a lunatic. And then Miriam and Aaron die. His only two loyal people, his sister and brother, they die. Aaron dies on Mount Hor. It's in Jordan of today. Here, if we travel up to Kadesh Barnea and then cross over. Just right across in Jordan here is Mount Hor. It's 4,580 feet above sea level. Right up on top is the traditional tomb of Aaron. We visited that tomb a few years back. So all the while, Moses encounters opposition not only from the people, but from the surrounding people. From Edom, Arad, Moab, Midian, Sihon, king of the Amorites, Og, king of Bashan. It wasn't a hard day for Moses. It was a really hard 40 years. But finally, we have to get to the promised land. 
The Israelites did not spend 40 years wandering in the wilderness. They moved from the Sinai up to the tip of the Gulf of Aqaba, diverted to Kadesh Barnea, where they spend about 37 years. But they have to get on with this. The generation is coming to an end. So Moses moves them down back to the tip of the Gulf of Aqaba, crosses the King's Highway, and goes around by the desert route and comes through the back door of Moab. We followed that story in our study of the book of Numbers. Along the way, the kingdom of Sihon attacked the Israelites and the Israelites defeat the king of Sihon. They defeat Og and his kingdom. So they have a couple of victories. And finally, they move down onto the plains of Moab. Here's the eastern mountain range on the right-hand side. The plain of Moab, the Jordan River flowing south, the plain of Jericho, and then Jericho itself, where they are going to stage for war, cross the Jordan River and attack at Jericho. But here, on the plain of Moab, is where Moses speaks to the people. It's where Deuteronomy takes place. If we look from ground level, we can see the eastern mountain range, the mountains of Moab over here. That's Jordan of today. We can see on the plain of Moab, villages along the edge in Jordan of today. We have the Jordan River flowing south and then the plain of Jericho over here. If you look at the photo, you can see a road, a path really, too wide to jump over. And that path has very soft, almost a powdery soil. And every hour or so, a truck comes down that path, pulling behind it a very wide rake to smooth out the path. So that drones flying overhead, if someone tries to sneak into Israel from the east, they have to cross that path and the drones will spot the footprints. So every hour, the truck goes by and smooths it out again. Beyond it is a barbed wire electrified fence. Beyond that are minefields. Don't want to go over there. By the end of Numbers and the beginning of Deuteronomy, 40 years have passed. The entire generation that left Egypt has died, except for Joshua and Caleb. Only two have survived. How could two million people survive in the wilderness? They don't. They all die, except for Joshua and Caleb. A new generation grows up, hardened by that experience. And in this generation, this is the generation that Moses addresses in Deuteronomy. As Leviticus spoke primarily in the voice of God, Deuteronomy is spoken primarily in Moses' voice. And it begins, these are the words that Moses spoke to all Israel beyond the Jordan in the wilderness. In the Arabah, opposite Suf between Paran and Tophel, Laban, Hazaroth, and Dizheb. It is a journey of 11 days from Horeb to Kadesh Barnea. It takes 11 days to get from Mount Sinai to Kadesh Barnea. It took the Israelites 40 years. It tells you something of the conflict going on within the Israelite community. In the 40th year, on the first day of the month, Moses spoke to the Israelites according to all that the Lord had commanded him to speak to them. After he had defeated Sihon, king of the Amorites, who reigned in Heshbon, and Og, king of Bashan, who reigned in Ashtaroth and Edrei. So we begin Deuteronomy 1, 1 through 4. In Deuteronomy, Moses has found his voice. Gathering the new generation, 601,730 men that we counted up at the end of Numbers, the new generation, they're on the plains of Moab opposite Jericho, and Moses tells the new generation their story. A story told, not simply retold, but retold on the back end of 40 years experience to a new generation. Now in our next lesson, We'll look at how Moses tells his story and how it applies not just to the past generation, but to future generations as well. 
We'll look at how he tells the story. So five questions for discussion and thought. Number one, what's the Hebrew title of Deuteronomy? Not Deuteronomy, the Greek title, but words, Debarim, words. Number two, why is it important to have Deuteronomy conclude the Torah? Because Deuteronomy functions in the canon, in the linear movement from Genesis through Joshua, Judges, and up to Ruth, it functions as a bridge that will take us from the wilderness into the land of Canaan where the conquest begins. Number three, why did Moses balk when God told him to go back to Egypt and liberate the Israelites? He's way past his time. He's at the end of his life. And his life, though promising early on, he's been an utter failure. He's been living on the backside of the desert, taking care of someone else's sheep for the last 40 years. Number four, what did Moses learn through his 40-year experience in the wilderness? He went to graduate school in leadership. He had every imaginable problem that he had to solve. And number five, what do we learn by reading about the Exodus experience. I doubt any one of us has had the troubles that Moses had during those 40 years. And he persevered. And in the end, he prevailed. The story of Exodus is the story of liberation from slavery across a generation, a lifetime, and a movement into a promised land. It's a story of redemption. We are born in a condition of sin. Through the person and work of Christ, we are freed from slavery to sin. We move across our pilgrimage of life and we're promised an eternity in that promised land with the Lord. So it's more than just an historical event. It's a universal event. We hope you've enjoyed today's lesson with Dr. Creasy. Logos Bible Study is a global community of students who enjoy study, fellowship, and fun as they seek to understand the Word of God and to deepen their commitment to Christ. We hope to see you back again soon. And be sure to tell your friends about LogosBibleStudy.com.